We're back live now, and I'm so pleased to say that we have Anna Naden. So, uh, Anna, welcome to you. How are you? And it's very early over there in Chicago. Yes, it's a bright, sunny day. The sun came up about an hour ago, and uh, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. No, look, it is, um, I was explaining to the audience a little bit earlier, it's our pleasure to have you. Do you want to just say a few words about yourself before uh, and, and mention this, your work with the CHSH game, which is very relevant here? Well, sure. Uh, I'm the host and organizer of a, an enterprise called Quantum Computing with Anna, which involves a meetup group. And uh, if you want to join the group, we have lots of interesting events. Just go to meetup.com and search for quantum computing with Anna. Uh, I make YouTube videos on that topic. Uh, I studied quantum physics in my youth, worked as a software engineer most of my life, and then returned to physics when I retired about 10 years ago. And by the way, I can vouch for the study group being absolutely brilliant. I first got in touch with Anna, must be about only three or four months ago. And she's taught me so much in that time. Uh, I honestly recommend you joining her group. But on to today's subject, a bit about the work you've done with the CHSH game, which is very similar to the game out of Caltech and Google AI called Zeros and Ones. You can see that they're both related. But you've actually cracked CHSH, haven't you? Give us a bit of a background on that. Yes, well, a CHSH game is, is like ones and zeros. You have a referee and two players, and they share a quantum state. It's simpler. We talk about qubits are quantum bits of information, units of quantum information. The, the game we're considering uh, here has uh, six qubits. The CS, CHSH game only has two, so it's a little easier to un analyze. And what I did was um, I basically proved that if Alice and Bob, the two players, share a quantum state, then they can win more often than if they don't. And I did that by looking at the measurements and the quantum states and doing the calculation. And um, there's a YouTube video out on that that I made. Let's concentrate now on a solution for zeros and ones. And I stress that we, Caltech and, and Google AI have not released, they've released the video that I played earlier, but they have not released, you know, the quantum circuit or the algorithm or the, actual way they've done it. So Anna and I will discuss that now. But as I say, this is something that played classically, you're just going to lose. So how on earth can we actually win the game? We are now writing quantum applications that not only are orders of magnitude faster than supercomputers, Quantum computers just do it so much better. But not only that, they can sort of do the impossible like we're doing now because of superposition and entanglement. What do you see as the starting point, Anna, to try and understand the solution to zeros and ones? I think we need to think about a physical picture, try to imagine uh, actual objects, particles, uh, in this case, light. Uh, I think, you know, the two players in the game, before the game starts, they prepare some photons, some particles of light, and trap them with mirrors. And then as they're playing the game, they perform measurements on, on these light particles. And according to the measurement results they get, they decide what move to make as they play the game. And that's, that's the basic uh, concept. In quantum mechanics, there's, 
kind of two parallel worlds. You have the quantum state, which is a mathematical object that has a basis in reality, but you can't observe it directly. And then you have measurements that you perform, and they give you either you see a photon or you don't. E either you detect some light or you don't, and that's a measurement, and that's the reality of it. And that's what Alice and Bob do to determine uh, what move to make in the game. Now, the word measurement in the quantum world means something very, very different from measurement in the classical world. It all goes back to uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Whereas like in the classical world, we can say where an object is, we can know its momentum as well. So, you know, you've got Euclidean space, so you've got three dimensions, uh, X, Y, and Z, and you, you can have a momentum and you can know where everything is. This is how we landed on the moon. But in the quantum world, it, it's different, Anna, isn't it? Well, yes. Uh, when you measure a photon, you, you get, there's only two possible outcomes. So if you measure the position of a particle in the real world, you can say it's five meters from me, it's two meters away, it's four meters away. Uh, two meters north, one meter west, uh, you can get a, a number, any any result. When you measure a photon, you get one of two answers. And and that's quantization. That, that means that there are only a, a limited number of outcomes, in this case, two. So that's the quantum mechanical aspect of measurement. Exactly. So it's it's either what we call up or down. But the interesting point then is if you measure it on one basis and then you, so let's say you measure on the z-axis, then you measure and you get a one, then you measure on the x-axis and then you go back and measure the z, it's, it's lost that property. It's now only a 50-50 chance of being up or down. There's a, there's a mystery, isn't there, Anna? Well, yes. I mean, the the act of performing a measurement changes the state of yes. the electron or the photon. And so that um, there's a experiment you can do with sunglasses, with Polaroid sunglasses, where you you cross them at a 90 degree angle and no light gets through. And then you insert a third one at a 45 degree angle and somehow magically more light gets through, even though you put something in there that you would expect to block it. So it's it's kind of paradoxical and, and it's only, it's due to the fact that when you measure an electron or a photon, it changes the state of it. Let's talk about superposition because when we start off with the qubits, we're gonna have a Hilbert space of I think there's 64, probably more, but each qubit, and now for the audience, this is where it gets a bit weird. In a square, in the classical game, you put a one or a zero, and that's all you can have. But in the strange world of quantum physics with superposition, the qubit can actually be in many, many states at once. Anna, can you comment on that with respect to this game? Sure. The qubits are the states of the photons or the electrons. And uh, Alice and Bob set up the particles before the game starts. And because the part particle can be either in the one or the zero, then the result of their measurement can be either zero or one. And that just corresponds to the fact that they can place a mark in different squares. Uh, this is like the game of knots and crosses where you're placing squares on a three by three uh, uh, grid. And uh, 
the fact that you have a superposition of zero and one means that they have a choice about where they place their mark as they play the game. They have a choice of what move they make. So with respect to this game, the first thing, and correct me if you see it differently, but the first thing that the video explained, the first thing that Caltech and Google said that happened was that each qubit was in all the states that there could possibly be in the three by three grid which we, mm -hmm. we know is the Hilbert space. And then when the referee throws the dice to signify which row the blue team used and which column the red team used, when he throws that dice twice, those two results, those two qubits have to be entangled. Now, can you explain what entangled is and how we know it's going to give us the same result, which is what we want in that interlocking square? Well, I'll try. I mean, entanglement yeah. is something that physicists have been struggling with ever since Albert Einstein uh, wrote his famous paper in the 1930s. Um, where he argued that quantum mechanics was incomplete. Uh, and no one understands entanglement. We can do calculations like when I analyzed this simpler game, this CHSH game, I did calculations of entanglement, but it's basically uh, still a mystery. For if you have one particular situation, then you can do calculations. But if you try to explain it in a general sense, it just becomes a mass of, of confusion. But basically, in order for Alice and Bob to win a round, there has to be a relationship, a correlation between what Alice does and what Bob does, because um, they can't, we can't have a situation where Alice puts a one in the center square and Bob puts a zero in the center square, then they lose. So we want to avoid that. So entanglement produces a relationship between Alice's measurements and Bob's measurements such that they never uh, disagree, so that they never make an illegal move. And entanglement is basically a, a relationship between quantum bits that is a relationship between the photons or the electrons that they're measuring. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance because it's it defines non-locality. It's like you and I can't shake hands because I'm in Perth, you're in Chicago, but in a quantum world, you you know you have this non-locality, which is something is intrinsically related to something else. That's very, very handy for this game. So, Anna, okay, so we've got these qubits. They are in a superposition of every possible combination. And then we're reducing that combination to suit the rules and to suit a winning position. So we entangle the qubits following on what the referee throws. Is that a good summation of where we're at? Well, I, I don't think so. I, I think the entanglement is done before the game starts. Hmm. And uh, what happens after the referee uh, throws uh, their dice is measurement. So you have two steps. You have first to entangle before the game starts. And by the way, you have to do a separate entanglement for each round that you're going to play. So and you, Allison, you would have to, so to interrupt you, but you would have to entangle every qubit with every other qubit. Yes. Yes. And um, now there's a thing called a bell state. Lots of people will know what that is. Uh, novices might not, but a bell state is merely where two qubits are entangled 
in a very strange way that they have a relationship with other battle states. But are you suggesting for, you know, for the general audience, are you suggesting that a bell state is set up between every single qubit with every other one? Because we don't know what the referee, we don't know what that intersecting square is going to be. No, we don't. So it's like a bell state. It's more complex than a bell state because oh, we wow. have more than two qubits and a bell state involves two particles, two qubits. And in this game, we have six. So it's like a bell state. It's, it's kind of a generalized bell state. And uh, by the way, when Alice and Bob play around, when they make a decision, when they perform a measurement and put down their zeros and ones, that destroys the quantum state. And so uh, if they're going to play 10 rounds, they have to prepare 10 entangled states, all of them identical, before the game starts. Oh, I see what you mean. I I'm still not sure of, we don't know the intersecting, sorry, that's the word I was looking for, the intersecting square, they have to be in a bell state with each other. I keep getting back to that. You agree with that, though, don't you? It's basically what the video said. Would you like to watch the video again, Anna? Sure. Yeah. I'll, and I, I, I've just had a couple of people asking me to play the video again. So let me play the solution. You probably already figured out that, even with the best classical strategy, the game of zeros and ones can't be won with certainty. In fact, the more times you play, your odds of winning get exponentially worse. But things are different if we're able to see the world through a lens that brings the quantum realm into focus. If you can access it, you can unlock powers that make the impossible possible. For example, you can win this game 100% of the time, every time you play. Researchers at places like Caltech and Google are learning how to build new machines that act as our lens into the quantum realm. We call these machines quantum computers. Since we don't yet know how to access the quantum realm directly, we can use quantum computers as a bridge between the two worlds. Computers enable us to represent and transform information about the physical world as a series of states, zero or one, on or off. We call these bits. Quantum computers take us a step further. They enable us to represent multiple realities simultaneously as a series of quantum bits, both zero and one, on and off, at the same time. We call these qubits. So how can the quantum realm help you win every time? By using qubits, the two sides can write their answers in a way that guarantees they always win, even when no communication between them is allowed once the game begins. Here's how it works. Before the game starts, each side writes down the four combinations that satisfy their even-odd constraints. For blue, that means these four rows with an even number of ones, and for red, it means these four columns with an odd number of ones. Now each side uses their own set of three qubits to store their valid answers, where each qubit represents a single square. Combining these four times four combinations results in 16 possible realities that the quantum computer can store simultaneously. At this point, if the referee checks the group's answer by asking the quantum computer to reveal the state of the six qubits, the referee will find themselves in one of those 16 realities. But not all of them lead to winning combinations for the group. While each row is even and each column is odd, the intersecting square observed by the referee also has to match. Let's assume for now that the referee observes the middle row and the middle column. In this case, the middle squares in each row and column have to match. Out of the 16 possible realities, the blue and red side only want to keep the 8 where the row and the column match. To do this, 
we can use an ability that's unique to the quantum realm, known as quantum entanglement. This ability enables the two sides to link the state of their middle squares so that they always match. After this procedure, the only realities that remain in the quantum computer are the eight winning realities. When the referee asks the quantum computer for an answer, they find themselves in one of those eight realities with equal probability. They have no control over which of the eight realities, but it doesn't matter which one, because all eight lead to a win for the group. But what happens if the referee chooses a different row and column? The eight winning realities for the second row and the second column no longer guarantees a win. Can the blue and red sides update the state of their qubits in the quantum computer without communicating to still guarantee a win? The group needs to store one more piece of information in their qubits. Let's look at the two realities where the row is in the 0, 0, 0 state. For this row, there are still two options for the column. Remember that blue can only see the qubits in their row, so only the 0, 0, 0 and has no way of knowing the state of red's column. We can fix this using another important aspect of quantum states, but we have to go back to the start. When the groups store the possible states of the rows and columns in their qubits, the quantum computer allows them to assign a plus sign or a minus sign to each of the realities. You can think of these like positive and negative numbers, in the same way that you can add a negative 3 to a positive 3 to get 0. When two realities with opposite signs come together, they annihilate each other, like matter and antimatter. Before the game begins, the group agrees to put a minus sign in front of every reality with a 1 in the top square of the column. Going back to the eight winning realities that we saw earlier, we see this set of signs. Now, when we look at the 0, 0, 0 row, blue can distinguish between the two different realities for red's column. For one, they see the 0, 0, 0 state, which is linked to the 0, 0, 1 state for red's column, and for the other, they see minus 0, 0, 0, which is linked to the 1, 0, 0 state for red's column. This is enough information for blue to update their row to match any row that the referee might choose and still win. Let's see how this works in an example. If the referee chooses the bottom row instead of the middle one, leaving the middle column unchanged, here's the strategy that both teams agree on in advance. If a reality has a minus sign, nothing needs to change. The intersecting digits already match these cases. For the other realities, the recipe is simple. Blue just has to flip the state of their first and second squares. This doesn't just work for the 0, 0, 0 row, but for each of the eight realities. In the same way, a set of updates, like flipping the first two squares in the row, can be found for each possible choice of the referee, so that the resulting eight realities are always a win. Wow, Anna. <laughs> okay, any comment? Sure. It's a little bit confusing the way they explain it because they talk about the referee performing an operation to decide what Alice and Bob do, I, I or what blue and red, I've been calling them Alice and Bob, but it's blue and red. They decide what to do. Uh, w one thing that came out to me as I watched the video that I hadn't realized was that the players have to perform a quantum operation. In some cases, they perform a measurement and whether they get zero, if they get a one, then they have to flip certain qubits, and that's a quantum operation. And what that would mean physically is you pass the photon through a, a piece of crystal that changes its polarization. Um, if Alice and Bob are working with, or if red and blue are working with electrons, then you would pass the electron through a magnetic field. You have to do something to change its state. 
then they perform another measurement. So I think based on what the video showed, uh, we're in a, a better position maybe to perform the analysis and, and to actually prove that they can win the game 100% of the time. And I think that'll be a good topic for a follow-on event, exactly what measurements are performed and what decisions are made based on those measurements and what quantum operations are performed based on those decisions. Oh, well said, yes. Now, the plus and minus, is that the phase? No, I don't. Uh, I, um, I think it's it's the um, it's just the measurement outcome. I mean, uh, for an electron, the spin is you you pick a direction and before you perform the measurement, and the spin is either up or down with respect to that direction. For for photons, either it's vertically polarized or it's horizontally polarized, depending on what uh, what type of measurement you're performing. You might be looking for circular polarizations, or you might be looking in a diagonal. Either, either it's polarized this way or it's polarized this way. Uh, you, can, you can call it a phase because it can be plus or minus, and minus is 180 degrees opposite in phase from plus. So you you can look at it as phase. The other thing we're not addressing at the moment, and I can understand because this is complex, but we're not addressing the fact that these things are all automatic because there can be no communication uh, once the game has started between blue and red. So I'm just thinking, how can it read it and then decide whether to flip the two gates. Now that's a simple X gate uh, or Z gate, if we're talking phase, uh, placed on the other two qubits that aren't the intersecting qubits. But do you have any sense of how that can be done automatically? Well, uh, based on what we saw with the simpler game, the CSHS game, uh, I believe Alice or, or Red Blue, the first player, has to perform a measurement. Then they they get a result, yeah. plus or minus one or zero, up or down. Yeah. Then they perform a quantum operation. Then it's Red's turn. Red performs a measurement, gets a result, and based on that result that either do or do not perform another quantum operation. Uh, and after the operation is performed, they perform a measurement again. Uh, I, I'm not sure how many measurements are taking place in one round, whether it's two or four. This is something we'll have to answer uh, next time. But based on the measurement outcome, uh, they decide where to put their zeros and ones. Yes. And when you say, like, let's say, what would the the first measurement, would that be on any qubit or on the intersecting qubit for that team? I think they probably measure the collective state of more than one qubit because yeah. uh, in, in the simplest case, you're only measuring one particle, one qubit, but you can also perform uh, more uh, uh, complex measurements where you simultaneously measure two or three or all six. Now you wouldn't want to measure, you wouldn't want the first player to measure all six because that would uh, fix the outcome for the second player and they wouldn't have any choice about what to do. So yeah. probably they only measure three their own three well i'm not sure uh, which ones they measure or actually what combination they're looking for when you're measuring uh, a quantum state you're basically comparing the state of the particles you have with 
a reference, an expected outcome. That's the measurement basis, is what outcomes, what possible outcomes you expect. And uh, so that expected outcome can be any quantum state, any state of particles. So you have the states of the particles that Alice and Bob, that red and blue share, and you have this hypothetical quantum state. It's like a reference. You compare what you physically have with the reference, the hypothetical wow. state, and either it matches or it doesn't. Wow. Is, is there a quantum term for that? It's measurement. It's a projective yeah. measurement, they call okay. it. Wow. You see a, an analogy between this and the CHSH game where, you know, we get the inner product. How do you select which basis, measurement basis, the second one person is going to use? Let's say the computational uh, basis. And depending on what they get, does that affect what measurement basis the red team are going to measure on? No, because they're not allowed to communicate. The red team has to choose their basis according to what the referee gives them. That's all the information they have, I think. In the CHSH game, even though they can't communicate in that either, the way it's done is through using um, related measurement bases, is the best way I can put it, don't you think? Well, what we saw in the CSHS game was uh, we computed the probability of winning. Yes, yes. That was, you mentioned the inner product. That's a mathematical operation that gives you a probability. That's how you get probabilities for a, a quantum system. Mm. So Allison, or, or Red and Blue aren't going to be performing no. inner product operations. They're just doing measurements. But, the, but mm. as, as physicists, when we stand outside the system and analyze it, and, and when we're going to prove that they can win 100% of the time, we're going to be taking inner products, mathematical operations, and we're going to get one and zero corresponding to a 100% chance of winning. Yes, that actually is what I was thinking. I was thinking what we need is the inner product to equal 100%. 100%. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's that's the task that we're going to have to do is to construct these quantum states and perform the calculations and show that we get 100% um, so that we can explain to our wonderful viewers why red and blue win every time are you comfortable you understand the logic do you think <laughs> i can see a smile on your face well i have the big picture i i know they perform a measurement i know they flip a bit based on what measurement they get uh i don't know what the measurement basis is that's what I've got to figure out. And that mm -hmm. may take uh, a weekend of uh, effort. Or maybe Caltech will eventually answer our email and tell us what the measurement basis is. That would be nice. That would be very nice. I, I meant to mention to the audience that both of us now have contacted Caltech and Google in the um, it, it, with the emails that they give for feedback, I can understand. Well, I, I, I'm not sure whether my, being in Perth, West Australia, whether they're interested in contacting me. But certainly, I think you they should be because they are very serious about bringing this initiative. The you know getting high schoolers interested in quantum computing by the fact that we could, once we figured it all out, we could teach them step by step what's going on. So I would have thought it would be in, to their benefit to release the actual circuit. Do you think it's just one circuit that performs 
operations depending on the outcome. Yeah, there'd be a it's, circuit for red and a circuit for blue. I think another possibility is a lot of times when I get uh, stuck on a quantum problem, I go to a, an internet forum called Stack Exchange, yes. Quantum Computing Stack Exchange. And there are some brilliant people. There are physicists that log in every night and answer questions. And I'll just present the game there. And if they give us the correct. states, if they give us the measurement basis, then it'll be a, just a mechanical operation for us to perform the calculations and verify um, that they win. Yeah, oh, look, that's that's wonderful. And uh, and now look, we've uh, we've hit eight o'clock on the dot, and I think we've made um, you know tremendous progress. So uh, I thank you very much for that. We will need a follow up meeting, so you and I will talk offline. I think would you agree? And this is really complex stuff. Would you say? Well, there are like 512 possible measurement bases or something like that. I mean, you have six qubits, six particles. There are a lot of different ways you can measurement, measure them. So there are a lot of possibilities that we have to uh, rule out in order to get the right basis. So uh, it is... There are a lot of choices we have to make. Okay, well, look, that is uh, wonderful. Let's let's leave it here. It's okay with Anna. We could do the same thing maybe next week or the week after, depending on any progress we make. And I can only thank you again, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Thank you again, Anna. Thank you.